Hello and welcome to Hear Me, See Me, the 2021 Equity in Missouri Higher Education Summit. If you're just now joining us, I am Sarah Sammons, co-planner of the summit and today's co MC. Um, and Sam, if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sam Bajak. I am a senior research associate with uh, the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. I'm emceeing this event with Sarah this year. We're really excited to have you all here with us this morning. We are. This is day three of the summit, and it's the summit has been amazing all three days, and we're just so happy that you're with us this morning. Um, so we will hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Clarence Green, this morning. But before we get started, we have a few conference etiquette reminders. All participants should stay muted to eliminate background noise. We want to see your faces, so if you have a camera, turn it on so we can better engage with you. All presentations will be live, so bear with us on any technical issues. The chat will be monitored for questions throughout the presentations. And later on, if you enter a session and decide it's not for you, that's okay. You can close out and go to the next one. Um, all sessions will be recorded, so you'll be able to access them after the conference. And don't forget to engage with us on social media throughout the day using equity 20, hashtag equity 2021 and um, at Modude and as well as our conference website. And I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for the morning. Uh, Dr. Clarence Green was named the vice president of culture in April of 2019. Um, he manages uh, human resources, institutional researches and effectiveness and policies. Um, Dr. Green previously served as an interim president for diversity, equity, and inclusion, interim vice president of human resources, and the police chief position for more than a decade. Um, Dr. Green has developed a philosophy of listening, aligning, and acting. He served on implementation teams for engagement, inclusive excellence, and strategic planning. That has led to several promising practices. His recruiting, hiring, and onboarding process has led to the unit being more than 60% racially and ethnically diverse, while also having 45% of his members being made up of those who identify as female. Um, and Dr. Green has served in law enforcement for more than 25 years. Uh, he currently serves on the United States Attorney General Law Enforcement Coordinating Committee. He is a state and regional trainer in the areas of implicit bias, racial profiling, and community policing. And Dr. Green also has a bachelor's in sociology, a master's in higher education leadership, and a doctorate in educational measures and routine life tasks. So welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you. I, I am very honored to be here and for this opportunity to, to meet with you all today. Uh, this is really my first time ever doing anything virtually as, as far as speaking, so it might be a little awkward for me. Uh, so please aid me and, and give me a little grace. I'm excited to share my experiences with you and learn from you and with you as we work through uh, my organization's journey for creating a meaningful work experience. Having a but for having a meaningful work experience that has a focus on inclusion. The organization setting is in rural Missouri. It's, it's where we're located. We will explore our organizational culture as well as engagement and inclusion. I hope and trust that from our presentation and our work and our time together today, that there will be some elements that will help uh, with your toolbox that, that you use within your campus or in your community. Are the slides advancing? Um, do you see a little, really, there you go, you got it. It's, it's working now. Okay, perfect. Uh, something I wanted to just talk about and get out in, in the air is I am a police officer by trade and I have served in policing uh, for a little bit more than 28 years. As such, I have, I, I have also worked in the division of culture for two years. As a police officer, I have worked with many teams that have infused diversity and inclusion efforts. In, 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 in university police here at Northwest, we have 15 full-time members and over 50 plus students. As stated, we're in a rural community with a population that, that makes up underrepresented folks of, of really less than 1%. But at UPD, we have historically had more than 20% of our officers make up underrepresented populations, 20% or more have identified as women 
and 20% more, 20 or more of our students have either been underrepresented populations and are of international status. Today, we have more than 60% of our, of our officers who identify as an underrepresented minority, more than 50% identify as a female, and over 40% of our students are either underrepresented minority or of international status. I say that because when I talk about historically, we have done this for more than 20 plus years in, a, in an area that has less than 1% diversity. But not only is the team uh, diverse, it's also very highly functioning. More than 50% of our members have a graduate degree and are working on a graduate degree. More than 70% of our members have a bachelor's degree and all but one of all of our members are currently enrolled in courses with only one of our members not seeking a bachelor's degree at this time. The unit is very high performing. It's connected across campus. Uh, it works with our faculty, staff, and employees daily, it, it, and, and really is engaged and is a heartbeat of our campus and community. As the VP of Culture in my role, it's really to infuse organizational uh, engagement as well as a sense of belonging. We measure that in our students through our climate survey, which specifically targets our sense of belonging. We measure that with our employees, our faculty and staff, through our uh, engagement survey, which we conduct every other year. Within my purview, I work with teams such as human resources, institutional research and effectiveness, and the police. The demographics of Northwest is roughly, we have 700 employees, 250 of which are faculty, about 1,200 student employees, a little bit over 8,000 students. At this time, more than 40% of our students identify as first gen, 11% of our students are underrepresented. Less than 6% of our employees are up. And so on our journey today, why we're together, we're going to hit on what was our spark. We're going to talk about listening, aligning, and acting. And then we're going to define a bunch of terms so that we're all working with the same terminology. We'll talk about our development model, as well as we'll talk about a few other uh, key things that has helped us in our work. All of this will be underpinned by being a Bearcat. Being a Bearcat is arguably our institutional values because they are known throughout our organization by students and employees. So to think about the terms and the level set on those, culture is really what we believe is to be shared beliefs, norms, and values that are uniquely practiced within an organization. For us, a perfect example of culture would be OABA, once a Bearcat, always a Bearcat. And it's lived out a lot in our hiring practices and just our, our organizational involvement within our community, our employees and our students, the way they go about showing pride and doing things within our campus. Our culture is lived out that way. Inclusion for us, and for me, when I think about inclusion, I think about the active and intentional and ongoing engagement with diversity. But for us, it's not just a number. It's giving voice to those individuals to be a part of something. So if they're on a team or a committee, their voice matters. Their voice is going to be listened to. And the things that they're recommending are going to be carried out. There's going to be action on it. So we must work to be inclusive, to have more than one or two or three or four identities at a table that, are, that is giving input, especially around policy. Engagement, the extent to which employees are motivated to contribute to organizational success and are willing to apply discretionary effort to accomplish tasks according to the achievement of the organizational goals. When we talk about engagement for our work here today, it's primarily going to look a little bit at the past from 20 to 20 to, to, to moving into 21. Just like most organizations, our engagement is not at its best right now because something has happened in the world beyond COVID, uh, I think to really fragment our engagement at this time. When we think about underrepresented minority groups, we're gonna specifically focus on those groups that are identified within that definition, Asian, Native American, or American Indian, Alaskan Native or Pacific Islander, Black or African American, Hispanic, or two or more races. And so what, what brought our work and really elevated um, being a Bearcat for us is what happened to us in, in 2020. In 2020, we were first faced with a racial incident that rocked our institution. 
on May 29th of 2020, a video was posted on Twitter of a George Floyd reenactment. The reenactment involved a student who was accepted to attend Northwest and two other students who were slated to attend other institutions within Missouri. The accepted student at Northwest had been on our campus on several occasions, as well as had a sister who was currently attending our institution. When this event happened, a media storm ensued at this time on the heels of this, as most of us know, was the murder of George Floyd, which occurred on May 25th, 2021. For us, we also had another tragic event that occurred within our community. We had a death of a student, Highland Hurl, which occurred on May 26th of that year also. He was tragically killed in his home in St. Louis, outside of his home in St. Louis. He was a, a, a historic member on our campus, very profound. He was the president of Alpha Phi Alpha Incorporated. He was also the president of our Black Student Union on our campus as well. What was so tragic about him is two months prior to Kylan's death, his brother was killed also. Then unfortunately on the night he was killed, he lived with his grandmother and mother. His grandmother, after the shots rang out in front of their home, she went outside to see what occurred. She passed away of a massive heart attack when she noted Kylan had died. And so this mother, grandmother and Kylan were all heavily connected with our campus community. And so at this time, it was a horrific time for us as an institution because we were facing this racial incident, but also members of our community were, were grieving at the same time they were angry about what had occurred with that reenactment video. We had also learned from our legal team that we would lose a possibility of a lawsuit because of this, they slated this as a First Amendment right of this individual to carry that act out. And, and so we were at a, at a lose-lose situation at that point. We worked with our employee affinity group starting after that, our student leaders, as well as our Black alumni. All of these groups helped craft and put together a letter reference to our institution's position regarding um, what had occurred. Following that, that letter that was released across our campus and within the public, another media storm ensued. Folks responded, didn't respond in the way we had anticipated to the news that we had put out. On the heels of that as well, our AVP of ODI made a statement on social media that further aided in the storm. All of these events merged and it kept things just really brewing and at a heightened state. Our students and alumni issue statements for removal of members of our ODI team and other leaders. Things were very heated. A hashtag was also created on multiple sites and platforms. This hashtag shared experiences that students had within our community as well as our campus. Uh, those experiences were not uh, good experiences. They were all negative. Our black alumni and student leaders rallied together, developed really a list of eight demands. By July, so we had worked on this from May through July, and we're still working on some of these elements today. Um, and after weekly meetings with all of those individuals, all of those demands were accepted with the exception of removing the student. This event still has ramifications for several folks across our campus. Several folks who were involved in this event, from leaders on our campus, from even students who spoke up or about the incident, have faced ramifications, whether it was removal from certain national committees, not hired for certain roles, whether that was in the institution or external from the institution. And some folks have suffered some well-being consequences because of just the trauma they experienced by going through such an incident. But one thing was a huge positive that I believe occurred from this incident. And that was really an affirmation of our culture, which was lived out by our students and employees. And I believe that is our competitive advantage. And so when we think about culture, again, it's those shared beliefs and norms that are uniquely practiced within an organization. For us, culture is a vehicle through which employees and students can attain a, main, a meaningful experience. The engine for us equals our growth. It allows us to get things done, to also have a growth mindset as well. The fuel is our purpose. This allows us to see the work through and maintain a consistent and or just be gritty 
to, to continue the fight when, when things are not going well. We have to stay involved and stay strong. The driver is our community. They guide us and take us to where we need to be. And so it's important for us to be heavily involved and connected with our community. So being a Bearcat, being a Bearcat really has five elements. If you look on our website, it's gonna be hard to find where being a Bearcat is really located. But I would say that it's really embedded throughout our website in everything that we do. Gallup had reported in 2016 that 27% of their employees strongly believe in their company's values. And 23% believe that their values influence their work. And so we'll talk about these five elements and how it influences our decision as well as our work in dealing with that spark incident that occurred in 2020. And so for us, being a Bearcat starts with Bearcats Learn. And so we go to class, we do our homework, we, we, we do all of our assignments on time, we don't cheat, we don't plagiarize, we remain agile, we remain a learning environment that changes with time and with new information. So we have intellectual humility. We are open to new ideas as we actively participate in our own learning experience. And we own our thoughts, actions, and behaviors while respecting others. One way we demonstrate this is through our learning model. We use this learning model to help even with our profession-based learning experience for students, as well as our employee improvement plans, our employee development plans. And so a lot of times organizations think of those as a negative, but a development plan, really every employee should have a development plan, which is about growth and what's, what's gonna be next for them or what do they need to be working on to really improve or connect more with their work. And so for us, we use this 70-20-10 model. And, and what we're trying to do is get more experiences on the 70%, where people are leading actions or serving in an interim role, but they have some sort of assignment that they have to do that's really task related, because that's where the meat and potatoes and the real learning is gonna occur. The second phase for that is mentoring for us, which really is gonna allow us to help in, in, in infuse additional information and ideas in the ind individual that's going through the development plan, as well as what we know is reverse mentoring occurs. They're gonna learn just as much by being a mentor as the person who is being mentee. The 10% is really the formal education, whether that's sending someone to a training or a conference, or they're having a hard skill actually develop. But the mentoring is where it's at. And for us, an example of that is, when we have an employee who is now putting a different role than what they once were, and they have to lead a meeting or they're attending meetings, that mentor works with them to think about what do you think will be said at the meeting? Do you have an agenda? What do you think the difficult questions that will be asked? Who will ask those? What are some questions do you think you'll be asked that perhaps you should script the response for? And so a lot of those things can be worked out in the mentoring session as well as when you leave that meeting, you want that mentor to reconnect, to, to just reaffirm or debrief that individual. What happened that we didn't anticipate? What do you think we should do next time? How do we ask, answer Mary's question around this topic? What data should we provide in the future to help move us forward? All of these, those things occur through that development model. Bearcat's learning is also about just challenging the process because we know all paths are going to be different. Everyone's achieved growth at a different pace. I think a lot about Nipsey Hussle when he said, how do you wanna live? Do you wanna be at war with yourself and at peace with the world? Or would you wanna be at peace with yourself and at war with the world? Becoming at peace with yourself starts with learning. And so we have to get folks involved in learning, understanding themselves, and having meaning and purpose in what they do. And so the next element of being a Bearcat is Bearcats Connect. And what we mean by that is Bearcats lean on each other and seek help when they need it. We get involved, we collaborate, we develop networks, we work with others who represent diverse backgrounds and viewpoints, we promote an inclusive environment. We do this through our campus by using RACI. RACI is just a model which, which, which really helps teams be formed and developed and carry out actions. The R in RACI stands for the responsible person. That is the person who's really gonna do the work. 
The A stands for the accountable person within racing. The accountable person is the person who's gonna measure the work as well as they're gonna define and scope the work. So the responsible and the accountable are gonna to work together closely so that they understand here is a deliverable that will be needed once this product or solution is brought back to the informed. When we think about the consultant, the C part of racing is those team members who are going to help solve that problem or bring forth the new product. They're just made up of, they're just a team. The I is those people who are going to, who are going to be informed and, and, and they're going to make a decision or they're going to measure the solution that is brought back to them or the product. And so RACI is a model that we use that is very helpful. We deliver this model by the use of teams. On our campus, we call them green teams. But if you were to study red teaming, which is a military concept, uh, in our, just because we're Bearcats and green's our color, we changed the name to green teams. But really, red teaming is, is what it is. We use that concept to build teams using the RACI model, which go out to solve solutions. It really empowers more voices across our campus. It's about inclusion. It brings in those different identities to have voice in making policy, solving problems, as well as offering new products. So I, I really encourage the use of some sort of team. Anybody who's worked with a team, we use a problem solving methodology throughout our team. Our problem solving methodology is titled CATS 2.0, but it's not much different if you use the problem solving methodology of PACE or if you are a Six Sigma person, you use the DMACC, uh, all of them start with something similar. You're gonna define the problem, you're gonna do some sort of analysis, you'll offer some sort of measure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to be trying to solve a problem and bring forth a solution. For us also, this is a process map that we develop to help with kind of double loop learning. Within the RACI model, using the consultant, as well as the responsible, we hope to have those identities represented, but we also know by creating this model, this helps us also ensure that we have more identities involved in decision making. And so at our institution, our Board of Regents really passes all of our policy and processes. Our NLT, which is noted on this process map, is our Northwest Leadership Team. They're our, senior, they're our, they're our most senior team who report to the board. They're made up of six vice presidents. Our SLT is our senior leadership team who will get the policy first uh, to make a review and offer input within it. It will then go to our two governance committees who are made up of our, who's our faculty senate and our staff council. If it's a, it involves students, we'll have student input in there, in there as well. And then legal would be our last step before the policies reshuffled back through for final eyes on it to validate and to help explain why we're leaving something out or why we're including something in addition. Uh, and, and this is really, and this is something new we really started uh, about a year ago, and this is really showing some good benefits to our organization as we move forward. Something recently we took through this process was, was moving some employees, trying to get closer to that 15 hour dollar wage rate, moving some employees through that process and targeting them within our budget to only uplift that segmented group through a shift differential. Uh, and it got huge results of walking through that process. Now, everything we do, we don't get huge results. We recently tried to start a process of looking at uh, equity through a different lens by thinking about uh, leave for those who are childbearing. And that was, un that, that was very unsuccessful for us. It did not make it through the process successfully. Most of our teams at this time uh, were not supportive of creating a policy as such. But Clarence is not done because he's a, he's a fighter. We will be bringing that policy uh, back again. And so the next element of, of being a Bearcat is Bearcats care. We value wellness, we take care of ourselves, we take care of each other, we take care of our campus as well as our community by following health and safety guidelines. We eat well and we get appropriate rest as well. We celebrate and we value difference. We also reach out to others in need. We keep our campus clean and safe. We greet and welcome friends and visitors alike. By doing this, really what we're trying to do is encourage the heart of all of our employees, 
are our students, as well as our community. By helping our students' employees understand their purpose and what they do has meaning, whether they're students, employees, or they're a member of our community. We enact in well-being initiatives that allow us to value students and employees. Something we recently launched is the well-being green team that's working towards bringing back some solutions to look at how do we build more purpose into work? How do we build more purpose into school so that we're connecting with our, our students? We feel like we have to get ahead of the mental health epidemic that we're currently facing. We believe we can do that through creating additional well-being initiatives that allow for more agility and flexibility across the classroom as well as the work experience. So I'm very excited about what the future is going to bring and that green team, what solutions they're going to bring back to us to make decisions. Also, Bearcats practice civility. We uphold and, and, and we uphold unity and responsibility. We reach out to others. We keep ourselves and others safe. We do not use racial or other derogatory slurs. We hold ourselves to higher standards and accept others for who they are. We do not tolerate sexual or dating violence. If we choose to drink, we know our limits. We do not use drugs. We do not engage in bullying of any kind. We do this by using what we call listening, aligning, and acting. In 2020, when that incident occurred, the first thing we did was define this model of listening, aligning, and acting, and how we're going to go about doing that. So in 2020, the first thing that we did was to listen. We wanted to gather all of the stakeholders that were involved and send and have town halls, have listening sessions where we just simply gathered the information of what folks were feeling, what had occurred, and what things that they believe that would improve our situation. So that was the first thing was listening. Aligning for us meant taking all of those notes back, theming them, and then revalidating those with all the groups we met with, as well as sharing those across campus and asking for additional feedback. Is this what we should be working on? And then how do we prioritize this as a whole campus and a community, along with our alumni base? which is roughly 100,000. And so it was, a, it was a huge task to gather that information. And the acting was formally going out and doing the, the work that was asked of us, acting on the, that alignment. And that alignment came down to eight to 12 things, the eight things that our students and our alumni had pointed out, as well as about four to five additional things that were gathered through our campus community that we knew we had to work on. Uh, when I think I, there's a book titled Forged in Crisis, it's written by Nancy Cohen, and she talks a lot about building relationships and teams and never letting a good crisis go to waste. And, and so I encourage everyone to think about when you're in the middle of a struggle, it is the best time to build a team and to do something very special. We also are, are embedded with inclusive excellence. This is something we've started about a year and a half ago on our journey of how do we bring about more inclusivity within decision making, within all aspects of our campus community. There's something out there called the, the, the Inclusive Excellence Compass. It is a great guide to think about how do you go about ensuring that you have identities on all teams? How do you go about ensuring that you have identities involved in all decision making? It is an excellent tool I think for all of us to consider utilizing or just putting in our toolbox to use at different times that I, I believe will help us as, as well as aid us in our journey on, on, around equity. Bearcats show pride. We represent our university to this fullest. We support one another and share in the university's achievements. Our closets are filled with Bearcat attire. We sport, we, we sport those Bearcat paws with, with a lot of pride. And for me, when I think about Bearcats Show Pride, it's about inspiring a shared vision. And it really ties together the entirety of being a Bearcat. So we work to ensure our expectations are aligned with our efforts and actions. And so it's one thing to have a goal, and anyone can make a goal, but does your efforts align with, with the goal? So if you're not putting in the work, you will never complete the goal. So it's very important 
that efforts have to be a part of that. We have to achieve goals and share progress along the way, as well as the final results, even if the results are not good. A lot of times I think we do a good job sharing when things are improving or going well, but we don't do a good job of saying we failed. We didn't meet our goal and here's why, and here's what we're gonna do next. Because I, I think there's a lot of pride in trying and we have to get there. Our culture is, is, is really not a solid and most cultures are not a solid. Most cultures have fluidity within it and they can be stretched. And ours definitely has been stretched. Our culture with students and employees were approved around the issues of 2020. I think we have come out pretty strong with that. We gained trust meeting the students' demands. We, we, we had a lot of trust built by just meeting those demands. We didn't meet them all, but we met the majority of those. We also had a lot of help with a donor giving us $1 million to put towards scholarships. That was profound. We also had heavy investments in our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which helped. Our leaders listening, aligning, and acting helped. But I believe the main thing that helped was being a Bearcat. I think our students and our rallying cry of our values is what led to us working through what occurred to us in 2020. Now, we still have a long way to go. There are opportunities that we still have as a campus and, and, and as the, a university. Some of that lies around our sense of belonging of marginalized students and employees. We still need work there. We have conducted student climate surveys for years, and we've recently issued our first uh, employee in climate survey in 2020. All of those results report, both of them report low sense of belonging across our campus and community. What we have to do is develop objectives and reasonable ways which we can accomplish improving that sense of belonging. Our hiring of underrepresented students and employees are below our targets, they're below our goals. So we have some work to do there. We've recently launched a team to bring back some promising hiring practices. And hopefully we can infuse those across our institution. We have embraced inclusive excellence. Hopefully that will help us with that sense of belonging as well. We have to align funding with all of those because that's part of the efforts. Just making a goal, putting a few people behind it is not good enough. We have to align our funding there as well to ensure that we can meet those goals. So questions that we're grappling with and perhaps others are also, are we willing to hire, are we willing really to, to remove a person who is a top performer but is a culture killer? That's a big question for us because we have some folks who perform very well, but they're a culture killer. So, so how do we go about making the right decision there? How do we measure performance? A little bit of measuring performance is easy, but when I think about it in the context of how do we measure trust, that's what's hard for me because I need to balance out which one is more important. Is it the performance of the employee or is it the trust? And so we have to have something developed to help us think about that because trust, we only move, and we move at the speed of trust as an organization. And if we don't have high trust, we're never going to be able to accomplish our goals. And so it's going to be very important for us to get there. And, and, and so what we're doing at Northwest, and, and we're not done with our journey by a long slot, we are chasing excellence. With our culture, we are really pushing for excellence. Not promoting in, in anything, but pushing for excellence. It does not, but, but when you're chasing excellence, what I want to just talk about a little bit is, it doesn't matter how hard we work towards that. We have to really care deeply about our work and have a lot of high passion for accomplishing what we're trying to achieve. Because really, we don't know what that excellence looks like because we have to involve more identities and in being more inclusive and having more voices at the table to inform us so that we'll know when we get close to there. I don't think excellence is something we will ever catch. I don't think that's true for most organizations, but I think it's really fun to be headed towards something that's so visionary, that's gonna change our environment of how we teach, it's gonna change our students, it's gonna change our employees, our community, 
And we have something truly, I think, special that, that we can help uplift our, our entire community with, but by chasing excellence of building an inclusive culture across our organization. Uh, that's really uh, our work and what we did at, at Northwest. I look forward to entertaining any questions that, that you might have. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Green, for your inspiring remarks. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Um, so I think Sam is going to do the Q&A. Yep, so the first question we have is uh, as follows. Since the student population turns over a little year after year, how do you maintain this type of culture? How do incoming students, both uh, freshmen and transfer students, get brought in from the beginning? Well, we have opportunities at, at, at Northwest. We meet with all students and parents pre after students are accepted and enrolled over the summer when we have our summer orientation programs, as well as our, our, our transfer programs for those students. We meet with those students and those parents early on and we begin to indoctrinate them with being a Bearcat, with what our culture is, what our expectations are. We have a lot of opportunities to do that, and we utilize those to start building that relationship. We also are looking at how do we send those out in our materials so that when, when students are enrolling, they know what they're getting, that they're enrolling into. They know what they're, that they're getting involved in. We haven't cracked that code yet, but we do have a lot of work that we do on the front end prior to students being on campus, as well as once students arrive, we have a a week-long orientation where we're really infusing in them of here are the expectations of being a Bearcat. And specifically, me and another individual get to meet with every first-year student, whether that's a transfer or a first-year freshman, and we get to explain to them what being a Bearcat is and what our expectations of being in, in our campus community mean. How do you ensure that all students and campus employees, I mean, I know you talked a little bit already about making sure that the messaging is consistent going forward, but as that life cycle progresses, um, that those values stick, that they know them and live them out. But the ensuring is the tough part for us. We haven't cracked that code yet of ensuring it. Uh, I think in our next iteration of our, of, of our employee evaluation, I think we have to do some work there and maybe map our employee evaluation around those values, being a Bearcat. I think we also have to do maybe some sort of evaluation or assessment of our students to where there's some one-on-one, -on -one, and, and maybe it's using our advisors, i.e. our success coaches, who are typically assigned all of our first-year students, and maybe attaching it to senior seminar. We don't have the, the code put together on that yet of how do we live this out and we reassure that we address it in with those returning students as well as our employees. One way we do with our employees here, we have two opportunities to meet with all of our employees at all employee meetings in the spring and in the and in and at winter. And we do talk about our values at those points. But we need a better way of infusing it so that it, it, it's it's lived out more. We do have signage across our campus, it's painted on walls, so there's constant images. For me, I believe it's, it's there because anytime we've had a tough event, uh, our students remind us as well as our employees, like, here's what you promised to me in those values of being a Bearcat. And so I believe it's there, but we can surely do better at making sure it has life in everything we do. As far as onboarding new faculty and staff, um, how do you do that so that they understand their role in defining culture? And I guess going back a little bit to your earlier point about that dichotomy of like a culture of trust versus top performing and figuring out where the like the balance is between the two. Well, we haven't figured out uh, as an organization, we haven't made the decision yet on which one we value you more. Is it the performer or is it? The, the the person that's highly trusted. When you think about higher ed and the environment it is around enrollment, 
Let's just use that for example. Our enrollment person is great, but, so, but, but this is just an example. If you're bringing us in top tier enrollment and our enrollment is booming, but you're killing everybody else in the process of doing that, are we willing to say, we're gonna move away from that person because we need a better person? We haven't yet answered that question yet as an organization, but because we have some culture killers within our organization in, in different areas. Um, but what we try to do with onboarding for our employees is, we do have onboarding sessions for all of our faculty, as well as our staff. We've recently completed an organizational profile. Anybody's familiar with Baldrige uh, or the Malcolm Baldrige Foundation or Missouri Quality, the first thing you should do as an organization is create an organizational profile. We recently just did that about a year and a half, two years ago. We've now infused that into our onboarding. We're also infusing that into learning across our campus. We have a learning management system through safe colleges. We're gonna put our organizational profile within there. Every employee will have to go to that training as well as be tested on that, that module aspect of it. And we hope that to have some benefits about helping employees as well as our students understand what it means and what values that we have as an organization. All righty, uh, we're coming up on time. So I'll, we got two more questions. So I'll ask them uh, both at once since they kind of feed into each other. Um, what advice do you have um, for engaging students in roles for making informed institutional decisions? And how do you create that cohesion between faculty, students, and staff? Or how are you working towards that? I know it's all a work in progress, but making sure that they're all working together and being informed in their decision making as they as they come together throughout all the different areas of of campus culture. It, that that's that's a big lift for us. We work a lot across our campus. We have a team that's really working hard to ensure that everyone has are, are making informed decisions and involved and how do we give grace in that? Our ODI team has really taken that charge on for the aspect of working with our employees to understand how to give grace, how to listen, because a lot of times as, as a, a faculty member or, or a senior staff member, a lot of times you believe the students are, are not adults, you know, especially in a traditional higher ed setting where most of our students are less than 22 years of age. And, and so, we'll think of them as kids when really they're just young adults, but some, they don't have the experiences a lot of times to make a totally informed decision. So they need some, some help or, or need to maybe sit with someone who's a little wise to get to help them figure out what's the cons and pros of a decision. So our ODI unit has taken that on through their diversity work and inclusion work with our faculty and staff, talk with them about how do they listen more? How do they align more? How do they assist students within decision making? And, and they're doing that also for students. We're on the early ends of, of that, and we do not have that. That's we haven't been successful other than this training that our ODI unit has, has launched with our faculty and staff. I believe we're beginning to see some benefits from it from folks. Um, maybe we're still not, we're still not hiring at the right levels within around underrepresented populations. But it feels like we're having more conversations and our faculty and staff are engaged more with helping folks make good decisions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Green. Um, we'll have to wrap it up there. Um, but we appreciate you sharing your expertise and insights with us. I think we could continue this conversation for a long time. So thank you so much. Um, the time is now 943 Central Time. And the breakout sessions will begin promptly at 950. You have time to take a quick break, grab some coffee or other caffeinated beverage of your choice and join one of our fabulous breakout session presentations. So up next, we have two blocks of breakout sessions, which will run from 950 to 1020 and then from 1030 to 11 o'clock. During each block, we'll present three concurrent breakout sessions and you can access those sessions using the Edge Events Conference website. And again, you're welcome to change sessions if you start one and realize that a different one may be a better fit for you. And don't worry if you cannot decide which one you would like, um, since all the presentations will be recorded and will be posted on the conference landing site. 
and the MDUDE website as well. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Green for sharing your expertise with us, and we hope that you all enjoy your breakout sessions.